Good morning, my friends. Grim here. I hope you're doing well today, and welcome to another pre-modern 10-minute deck tech. This one featuring Mud, aka Mono Brown Nonsense. So if you love old-school aesthetics to the point where brown artifacts rule the roost, if you love doing extraordinarily broken things, and if you love your opponent scooping while you avail yourself of arguably the singular most powerful mana base in the format, then look no further, my friends. Mud is where you want to be, so thank you in advance for watching. Thanks for tuning in to all of this pre-modern content. I hope the deck techs will stand the test of time. I hope they'll be useful for people finding them one, two, three, four, or even ten years down the line. Without any further ado, my friends, Let's check out a deck list. Let's see what mono brown nonsense in pre modern looks like. All right, friends, so to kind of begin with the ending, the way Mud wins, well, there are a few different ways, and as mentioned in the intro, your opponent's conceding is actually one of them. Be forewarned, this deck may not win you too many friends. People do find it relatively polarizing, and often concessions will happen because the opponent is sick of getting staxed and taxed and having no outs to your various broken old-school artifacts on and on and on, but if your opponent does indeed decide to grit their teeth and play it out, Black Vice is a major win condition in that your opponent is often so taxed they can't really empty their hand, Black Vice will kill them in short order under those circumstances, and if we're going on the beatdown plan, Karn Silver Golem can animate all of your prison pieces and turn them into lethal killing machines, assisted as always by the ever-powerful Mishra's Factory, and Mastacore, of course, is a 4-4 for 4, 4, 4, quite a fine rate, contr controlling the board, turning sideways to end the game. Even Metalworker can get in on the beatdown plan, so if you're wondering how all of these powerful cards translate into an actual win, that's usually how it goes, although there are a couple other things to keep in mind as well. But before we go line by line, really breaking down the deck, do note that a white version of Mud is absolutely viable. Enlightened Tutor, of course, representative of just how powerful white can be, tutoring your very best card for the moment, bringing actual removal to the <laughs> fray like Swords to Plowshares, and so on and so forth. But the power of Mono Brown Mud, as always with mono colored decks, lies in its land base. Just take a look. We have to actually start with the second column first because we know these cards pretty well by now. If you've been following pre-modern, pre excuse me, along with me, Wasteland, Rashad and Port, and Mishra's Factory. That trio is absolutely overwhelming in terms of the power, the efficacy, the efficiency, and Dust Bowl as the cherry on top to make sure that your opponents, if you have nothing better to do with their lands, well, they're not going to get to use their lands either. And we really break the symmetry with this type of stuff with all of our mana production, all of our rocks really powering up our side of the mana production while squeezing the opponents down to almost nothing. And then as if that wasn't enough, we have a full eight two mana producing lands, City of Traders times four, Ancient Tomb times four, both of course coming with major downsides. Ancient Tomb gonna be limited efficacy against aggressive decks and City of Traders. You have to sequence very carefully with this, and even if you sequence perfectly, it can still come back to bite you. But the power of those lands and the upside make it well worth any risks they entail. On to the spells, and Black Vice, as mentioned, is a major win con when your opponent is taxed or indeed fully locked out. So let's talk about some of those types of pieces. Sphere of Resistance, spells cost one more to cast. It's a three of Winter Orb. Players can't untap more than one land during their untap steps. Now, we really break the symmetry of both of those cards, especially Winter Orb, because not only do we have Thran Dynamo, Worn Power Stone, Metal Worker, and Mind Stone that all generate mana, even if we don't have any of those, we can still untap an Ancient Tomb or City of Traders to get more out of our Winter Orb than the opponent can out of their lands. Moving on 
to more taxing pieces, we have four copies of Tanglewire, which is obviously excellent in this deck for the aforementioned reasons, as well as just generally having a billion artifacts to tap down and not really impacting our mana production at all some of the time. And Mishra's Helix, which is a late game almost total hard lock if the opponent can't play meaningfully at instant speed. So I'm jumping around the CMC spread, but I'm thinking that the strategic presentation of these types of effects is more kind of uh, useful and understandable than just going along the mana curve. So jumping back down a little bit, Mindstone, of course, not only ramping us, but also crucially digging through the deck in a deck that otherwise does lack card draw. So Mindstone ramps you early, breaks the symmetry of a lot of our effects, and then digs you when you have the luxury or the need to do so. Metalworker is yet another mana rock this time on legs, so it does have slightly more utility as an attacker and a blocker. It also has the highest ceiling of mana production, but the lowest floor in that it opens us up to creature removal, and almost anything in the format will kill it. Powder Keg, speaking of killing creatures, is our out to wide boards. Being monocolored and not even being in any of the traditional five colors means that we lack removal in a major way. Powder Keg, therefore, is leaned upon heavily in terms of controlling the board, as is the aforementioned Masticor. Karn Silver Golem at the top end, as mentioned, is kind of our finisher, kind of the Izuri Renegade leader, or Kamal Fist of Krosa, if you prefer, of this type of deck, and also comes with plenty of combat tricks, both of his own and via his activated ability. Very interesting card, very thematic as well. Now let's just take a moment to realize, my friends, how well all those things come together. So just imagine, if you will, an opponent operating under a Winter Orb or a Tangle Wire playing a relatively normal deck. You know, it's not the Mirror or it's nothing else playing these Soul Lands or a ton of artifacts or what have you. And the opponent trying to cast spells while operating on very limited lands against fear of resistance. Meanwhile, we have one of our mana rocks, our more online. We're untapping lands that produce two. It is just totally and completely lopsided. Note also that we are mono brown. We do have a ton of flexibility. Cards like Felwar Stone, Urza's Blueprints, very main deckable stuff comes to mind to suit your preferences in your metagame. And also, Smokestack is probably the most commonly seen card that does not happen to feature in this particular list, but the list of possible and playable artifacts in pre-modern is certainly not small, so do your own research, don't be afraid to throw in a little spice as always. But moving on to the sideboard, of course, it's more artifacts. We've got Tormod's Crypt times four. We do appear to be relatively weak to those types of all-in graveyard strategies like Reanimator, Tormod's Crypt there for a no-brainer. Black Vice number four for when that lines up really well. Defense Grid times two. I'm actually a huge fan of this card and could even see it playing a third. It's just very, very nice to land as early as turn one in those types of matchups. Once again, we have the fourth copy of a card. This case is Masticor for when that lines up well against the opponent. And the remaining cards are a little more esoteric. Bottle Gnomes is our best kind of life gain card against Slot and other aggressive decks, but Crumbling Sanctuary is a spectacularly cool one of, which may or may not feature in some of the most exciting games I've had with this deck so far. It basically changes your life total to the amount of cards in your library for both players, but against Burn, you are definitely going to get there if you can stick this as long as they can answer it. And Phyrexian Processor, one of the coolest alternative win cons I have ever seen. Well, thank you very much for watching, my friends. I do appreciate it. Of course, if you have any spicy takes on mono brown or indeed white mud or anything else you want to throw at me, the comments are the place to do so. Thank you, as always, for watching, as well as to everybody, of course, who supports this content and my lovely opponents in our small little playgroup. It's been a great time, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Please stay tuned for more to come.